you're watching Bread and Roses, a political social television magazine. I'm Mariam Namazi and I'm presenting today's program with my fantastic co-host Bahram Suroush. Hi. And Faribors Puya. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> today's program is on secularism and why we think secularism is a basic right and it's imperative in any given society for people who are both religious and not religious. And for me personally, I don't need to justify this. I can just give one name, one name that's in the news today. And that's the case of Mariam Yahya Ibrahim, who is, has been sentenced to death by stoning in Sudan for adultery and for apostasy. And all she's done is married a Christian man and had sex with him, as, as we do when we get married or even when we're not married. And uh, you know, because of this, her life is in danger and she's in prison now with her 20-month-old old, old son. So for me, that's enough justification to say that secularism is a necessity. Abs Aaron? Absolutely, I agree, because the problem starts when you mix religion with the state and then you set out, lay down laws which are based on religion. So it violates the basic rights of the people, which are very private, to either, for example, to re leave a religion which has been assigned to them by birth or to marry somebody or to have sex with somebody who is not of the same religion all of these will disappear if there's secularism a separation of the state from religion which has been achieved actually in greater parts of the world in a civilized world but unfortunately it still survives and these are the problems we're dealing with um, you know society is full of uh, ideas there's some wonderful ideas people have strange ones religious ones you know um, fantastic ones yeah, so there's so many variety of ideas that people have we can't have one group of ideas actually dominating the functions of the state which is be for benefit of everybody so it's important for the state to uh, remain neutral. That's for everybody's interest. So you provide service, for this is education, you know, all the process of the state it needs to remain uh, neutral. It's in interest of everybody in society. I mean, that, that's my justification for secular uh, society and a secular state. A little earlier, uh, Reza Moradi and I went to uh, meet Anthony Grayling, AC Grayling, the well known British philosopher, at his office, and he discussed with us this very issue. He's the one who first coined the, the phrase that secularism is a basic human right. Let's go to that interview and then we'll come back and discuss it further. Thank you, AC Grayling, for, for meeting with us. I guess our first question is, what is secularism and what is the value of secularism for both believers and non? Firstly, let me say it's a great pleasure to be with you. I'm a, a big admirer of what you do. Um, secularism uh, has to be distinguished from atheism and from other isms, like, for example, humanism, which are naturally associated with it. Most people who are atheists are probably likely to be secularists, but there are religious secularists as well, because secularism is a view about the place of religion, the religious voice, religious organizations in the public square, as this impacts, for example, uh, public policy matters. And the idea behind secularism is that the, 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 the public square, a society, should be neutral with respect to all the different belief systems or no belief systems. That what people believe in their uh, private lives and in their religious commitments is uh, not relevant to um, the, the public debate other than as a point of view, as a, a special interest point of view. A well, I was going to say, I, mean, I think it's a very important point that uh, religious organizations and, uh, and movements should recognize themselves as interest groups and lobby groups. They have a point of view. Of course, they want to put their point of view in public debate, but they should take their turn in the queue with everybody else, other NGOs, political parties, uh, um, pressure groups, lobby groups. Um, whereas, of course, for historical reasons, in many societies, the religion has a massively inflated presence in the public square and it's given charitable status, it's given a seat at the top table and it's heard first by, by people in um, positions of temporal power. And that, I think, is, is where things have gone so wrong in our world. I mean, on the issue of neutrality, some might say that the very fact that um, a secular state demands that religion stay out of the public space means that it's not really neutral because it's giving... Uh, 
um, a sort of negative uh, viewpoint on religion, that it's not a good thing to be in the public space? Um, I, I don't, uh, it certainly is a view which has been, of course, developed from the Enlightenment thinking about how individuals living together in a society can best flourish. So in that sense, it is a, a positive view uh, about allowing all sorts of different viewpoints, all sorts of different beliefs and no beliefs uh, to coexist peacefully side by side, not privileging any one of them and not therefore coercing others either to believe or, or not to believe. So in, in that sense, it is a, a positive view. But the heart of it, the essence of it is neutrality with respect to these different viewpoints. That is, uh, you allow people to uh, have a belief and to practice that belief, providing it doesn't impact negatively on other people. But also, and very, very importantly, it uh, allows people who have no religious commitment, who are atheists or agnostics, who don't belong to a church or, or a religious movement, to live without the coercion or pressure or uh, a social um, bad odor uh, that used to be the case, and in some societies remains the case. I mean, you mentioned the fact that there can be believers who are secularists, but can religion, can Islam be compatible with secularism? Well, this is a very interesting question about uh, Islam because it would seem to be in the very nature of Islam that uh, a secular society is impossible because Islam uh, pervades every aspect of life. Uh, it is not just a religion, it's a social and in many ways a political philosophy as, as well. Because nowadays people use the term Islamism to mean um, uh, political Islam. But, but Islam is so all-embracing. Uh, it, it permeates the lives and thoughts of people from the very earliest moments of their lives all the way through their education. Um, the, uh, the, the, the presence of the, of the religions demand on or offer to people is there, you know, uh, uh, every few hours when the muezzin cries from, from, the, uh, from the mosque. So it's very hard even to imagine a translation of the English word secularism into uh, Farsi or uh, Arabic, which doesn't have a negative connotation. The, the, the origin of secularism in the Christian countries is a, a very interesting one. It was actually the church that first asked for separation of church and state, of uh, belief from temporal matters, because they didn't want the state interfering in its business. Of course, it wanted to continue to interfere in the state's business, so it was only a one-way uh, change of, of relationship. But the, the idea of secularism started with the religious, and uh, it took many centuries, actually, before it was adopted by the genuinely secular wing of society who said, yes, we would like to be able to do science, uh, education, uh, discuss public policy matters, uh, talk about the diversity and plurality in society and how we, how we uh, address it and, and uh, satisfy all the competing needs in society without having the distorting effect of a single religious outlook. And that really is something that perhaps from the 18th century has been operative in Western societies. I mean, uh, w one of the things that uh, we, we sometimes hear is that a, a theocracy or an Islamic state is just, it's fair, and, um, it, and it's needed for a moral society. And we often hear the Islamic regime of Iran or Islamists say that a secular society is an immoral one. What's your take on that? Well, it's, it's, a, it's a, a very tendentious thing to say. I mean, it's a party political view on the part of people who want in a theocratic uh, society, everybody to toe the line. You know, it's, it's um, uh, sort of demonstrably uh, a false view, this, because uh, it's a claim that there is a one-size-fits-all answer to how people should live, what they should believe, how they should think, how they should behave. And this completely ignores the great diversity and difference, the variety that there is in human nature and human interests and needs. Um, people sometimes talk about uh, what's called the golden rule in some uh, um, uh, cultures, do to others as you would have them do to you. But that makes you the standard for every one of the seven billion people on the planet, which is an absurd view to take. That if you really are going to be a good neighbor to your fellows in society, you should be thoughtful about the differences in the individuality and recognize that a society is a plural domain. In fact, the very concept of pluralism is, uh, I, I think, um, an uncomfortable one for um, Muslim thinkers because the ho homogeneity of society, the fact that everybody believes together that it's just one big 
uh, group with a, a shared outlook is of the very essence of what an Islamic society should be like. I mean, in, in the sense, uh, well, they, they would also say that, you know, secularism calls for religion being a private matter, mm -hmm. and Islam isn't a private matter, mm -hmm. it's a public matter, mm -hmm. and in, in a sense, uh, there's a violation of the right to religion by demanding secularism. What would you say to that? Well, the key thing in what you say there is that uh, um, Islam regards itself as a, as a public religion. Interestingly, this keeps alive uh, something that uh, pre-existed uh, the, the rise both of Christianity and of Islam, uh, because religion in the classical world was not a private matter, it was a public matter. What Islam has done is to combine the idea of the, the private aspect of it, your personal responsibility uh, to Allah, um, but uh, at the same time regard it as something which completely unifies and homogenizes society and makes everybody march in the same direction at the same pace. So it's a, an interesting hybrid of the most ancient forms of religion and the new young religious outlook which is represented by the Judeo-Christian Islamic tradition. Um, my response to it is, is to say that uh, the um, uh, demand that the beliefs and practices of the religion are a public matter, that it's a public duty of each individual member of the society to observe, to be observant of, of the religion, to follow its code, its practices, even what you eat and what you wear, and women covering their hair, that th this is a, a demand which very fundamentally violates the individual rights of, of people to self-determination, to liberty of conscience, to choices about how they're going to live and what they're going to believe. And it closes down so many human opportunities, so many human possibilities, that if everybody has to think just one way, believe and practice just one way, it's going to shut out an enormous range of uh, possibilities on the horizon of human life. So you wouldn't agree with uh, the idea that secularism is a Western concept? Well, secularism is not a Western concept, actually, because um, you look at India, uh, there are um, very, very ancient and uh, very deep uh, atheist traditions of thought, which imply, therefore, that society should be uh, a, a non-religious domain. Um, if you look at China, now here's a tremendous generalization about one-sixth of humanity. But uh, the, the Chinese can be very superstitious people, but they're not a religious people. They've never had a, a, a god, a deity who issues commands and so on. They talk about the concept of Tian, of, of heaven and the, and, and the way of, of uh, heaven. Uh, but that's a bit like the Stoic philosophers of ancient times who talked about the Logos, you know, the principle of things. So very large numbers of, of human beings have, have, have never had an idea that there is a, a god who is like a, an emperor or a king in the sky who issues orders and everybody's got to obey. And as a result, of course, by default, the view about the nature of society is a secularist view. Not given that name, maybe, but uh, in functional terms, uh, that's what it implies. So it, it isn't an exclusively Western idea, but um, as we think and discuss uh, um, about secularism now, uh, it is of course an idea which has been given a great deal of impetus by the European Enlightenment of the 18th century. So in that sense, the idea was revived and, and given more uh, juice, if you like, by the debates in the Enlightenment. And it, it has therefore been a very potent idea in the development of the, uh, uh, of the Western societies. The growth of science, the uh, technological developments, the building of institutions of law and democracy have all been associated with the secularist impulse that we get from the early modern period. Would, would you agree with those, uh, well I, I would think you wouldn't, but um, with those who say that as a result of the religious revival they call it, that we're living in a post-secular age, secularism is no longer relevant? No, I don't think that, because uh, I have a very different analysis about what's happening in, um, in the world with respect to religion. I think that, that uh, in the last decade or, or a couple of decades anywhere in the, in the Western world, um, the pressure uh, on religion and religious organizations that comes from the decline of religious observance, because there is a, a steep and increasing decline of religious commitment in the West. And this makes the people who have a zealous religious commitment anxious. 
So they raise the volume, they raise the activism, and it makes it look as though there's more religion, but actually there's just more noise from a sm <laughs> an increasingly smaller group of people. Right. It's a bit like if you corner an animal in a mm. room, it'll make a big noise, but it would have been more peaceful before. So actually the appearance of religious revivalism is a symptom of religious decline. And the empirical data supports this analysis because you look even at the United States of America, which is thought to be a very religious country because of its Protestant uh, uh, Calvinistic origins in the 17th century. In fact, uh, there, the Pew Center polling data over the last 30 years has shown an increasingly steep decline in religious commitment. They have a, um, a, a on, on their polling data, they have a, a, a box which says none, N-O-N-E, mm -hmm. So the people who tick this are known as nuns, you know, mm -hmm. a bit like, like the nuns yeah. in church. It's quite funny. And, and the increase, especially among the under 35s, is, is very significant. And organizations in America, the American Atheist Association, the AAA, the American Humanist Association, the Secular Society in America, the Skeptic Society, they, all of them are growing very fast and becoming much more vocal. So if that's and happening... And you're seeing that in the Middle East and North Africa as well. Well, that, that's the, the a, a remarkable thing. The rise of secularists thing. and, uh, you know, modern movements. Yeah. Sort of, well, yeah. th this is a remarkable yeah. and, and a very welcome yeah. thing because, of course, uh, a point that I, I'd like to, to expand on in, in a moment is that um, freedom of thought, freedom of conscience, freedom of inquiry, these are absolutely fundamental human freedoms which are so important for the health of society and the health of humanity's future that the liberation of the human mind from ancient superstitions and ancient religions, uh, the liberation of children from indoctrination into religious views which are either very difficult to get out of or which imprison them for the rest of their lives in a certain view. These are crucial matters. This is why in this age of ours, where we are able, everybody is able to talk to everybody through the means of electronic media, uh, this aspect of the conversation about our uh, future, the future of humanity, is, is key. Because it seems to me that we're a little bottleneck um, uh, period now. And alas, uh, a major player in this is Islam, and in particular Islamism, that, that aspect of Islam, which is uh, perhaps nervous, uh, frightened, um, feels threatened by the, the globalization of Western styles of secularism. And you can imagine, and you can even indeed sympathize with a very sincere um, a Muslim father who's worried about what his daughters will do and you know you can see the anxiety but maybe it's his sons who think they're going to take some action kick back at, a, at a, a, a way of living and looking at the world which they find inimical to them and which they find very threatening so this makes us uh, entering a little bottleneck a dangerous period where the people who have these deep commitments and who become very very angry and anger sometimes turns into violence and they do terrible things. They commit murder because they're afraid uh, that other people don't share their, their beliefs with them. That's the passage of time we're going through. And we see societies, uh, as in Iran, for example, struggling. From, from outside Iran, when people look at what uh, you know, is happening there, this is an educated, uh, um, mature society. There are many people um, there who uh, would love to have the freedom to develop and to flourish. Uh, who are attracted by these ideas. These uh, ideas are not Western ideas, they are human ideas. They are ideas about, about human flourishing. And yet there is a regime and there is a, a powerful influential group of people in the society who want to stop that. For, for people from outside, it, looks, it has the feeling of the 16th and 17th century in Europe when something very similar happened. And you do get people saying, and perhaps it's not a helpful thing to say, but you do get people drawing parallels and talking about a stage of historical development. Personally, I hope that's not true, because if it were true, then it's going to take another 300 years. <laughs> and however long you and I live, man, well, we're not going to get there. It's, it's not going to take that long, I hope, and I'm sure. I really, really hope not. Uh, you've, you've argued that secularism is a human right. Yeah. Uh, why? Uh, it is, it, without any question, a, a human right for people to be free of um, coercion, uh, indoctrination, um, proselytization, uh, being obliged to act, dress, live, and believe in ways that other people want to impose on them. Sometimes people say, oh, well, so you're a secularist, you want to impose secularism on other people. And this is a very, very false argument. The, the secularist argument is, look, think what you like and believe what you like, but you have a duty to others not to harm them by your choices. 
That's a very simple a statement, but it's a very deep statement, and it's a very important point. In fact, it was made by John Stuart Mill back in the 19th century in his wonderful essay on liberty, where he talked not only about the danger of political totalitarianism, but of social and attitudinal totalitarianism, and the, 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 the kind of imposition on people's lives that come from belief systems where very zealous, very eager people want to force you to live in the way that they choose. It's a key fact about moralists and religious zealots that they say, I think this, therefore you must do that. And that, of course, you can see from just that example, it's a human right to be free from the pointed finger and other people saying, you've got to live according to my beliefs and my choices. So it, there should be in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights more emphasis placed on the thing that says liberty of, of belief and religious practice and conscience or none. And the none part should be taken very seriously. Because even in a society like the English society, I don't mean the UK society at all, but in England, no school child is free of religious instruction, of religious practice, of prayers or hymns or whatever it might be in schools. There are very, very few schools where this is neutral. And you have to, as a parent, as I've done with my own children, uh, get an opt-out uh, from these religious observances. So, you know, it, it's so... It, it is so much like a great big oil tanker in the ocean to try and turn around people's views. Liberate the mind, free people, let them choose for themselves. In a matter as uh, important or unimportant as religion, let the people decide themselves when they have the facts. Don't indoctrinate children. That seems to me to be a form of abuse, in fact. I would use that word, and it's a strong word, but it does seem to me to be a form of abuse. Thank you very much. My pleasure. I hope you enjoyed that wonderful interview with AC Grayling. I mean, for me, it's interesting because you often have the religious right criticizing secularism as a form of discrimination against them. No, it's not discrimination against you. It's to stop you from discriminating about, against everybody else. Discriminate, discriminating against gay people, discriminating against people who decide to have sex outside of marriage, discriminating against, you know, women who decide not to wear a body bag and go out into the streets. Plus, it's to stop you from marrying nine-year-old girls and so on and so forth. So it's got nothing to do with you being discriminated against. It's about making society an equal playing field for everybody. Yeah, I, th I think th this is very uh, interesting. Always the right-wing groups in society, when you actually try to, uh, these element of protection, to protect, for example, children from physical punishment or uh, you know, to protect gay people from, you know, being beaten up on the streets. When you actually say they, there needs to be an element of protection for society and we need to keep these ideas out of, you know, you, parents don't have the right to um, punish children, for example, and children have rights, they always come up with this idea that you are imposing your rights and your view on society, on everybody else, on individuals and people who have, you know. They don't recognise, for example, that children have s separate sort of there are separate entities and they need to be protected. It's exactly the same with religious groups. When we say that you know state and its function needs to be neutral, they always come up and say, you are imposing your, your view. Well, this is the neutrality of the state. This is not about any, anybody's view. I have you know, many ideas about how society should, should run, how a state should run, but I don't impose it on other people. What I'm saying is that the state needs to treat everybody equally and the state should not have, you know, it, the religious group should not have specific interests within the state. Yeah, I think if, if, if they talk about imposition, somebody imposing their views on others, it's exactly the reverse. Secularism has come about because for, historically, uh, religion was part of the state or very close to it it was in a dominant position, and people who didn't believe in religion were the um, uh, downtrodden ones, who had no voice whatsoever. So it took a lot of struggles to come to a situation where you said that the basic um, principle of government should be uh, the citizen and civil rights, and separation of religion from the state, so that people who think differently, who have different uh, uh, world views, can have a voice in it, uh, in, in public, and nothing is imposed on them. So it is the religious uh, groups and institutions which have had the privilege, you know, they have, a, have had a privileged status. So because sec secularism, by definition, is uh, inclusive, so it allows for religious views, individuals, and organizations to exist. 
but a religious state, by definition, is exclusive because it excludes you as a non-believer from the state and from the enjoying the same rights as everybody else. Exactly, and I mean, it, it actually excludes a lot of believers as well because, you know, it's, uh, you, you know, I'm sure Marianne wants to just go about and live her life, other religions uh, you as know, well, the, yeah. the way she wants. And there are a lot of Muslims who are facing various punishments. And it's interesting, but religious states usually, there's always infighting between different sects, different groups, and actually different, different groups within the same religion are the victims of the dominant group within that religion, in, in that society. I think the point that Anthony uh, A.C. Grayling makes, I think it's quite important, that this is a human's you know, fundamental right to benefit and enjoy an environment which is free from imposition by other group, in particular religious group. I think that's a, so, such a crucial you know, point of view that allows people to flourish. I think that's, that's so important. And in a sense, going back to the whole concept of universality, you know, something that is a value that is good for everyone in, in, in a given society. In a sense, with religion, there is no universality because it is only prescriptions for people who belong to that group and not even everybody who belongs, who is considered to belong to that group, a very, you know, the, the most reactionary, the most repressive sort of point of view is acceptable. I think secularism is what helps to push forward universal values that irrespective of your beliefs, irrespective of your background, you have and you deserve a certain standard of life, a certain society that you can live in. And that's what secularism does. There's a universality to it that doesn't exist with religion. The thing is, if you want to maintain uh, the basic rights we take as granted, basic civil liberties, which has you know, taken hundreds of years to achieve, like freedom of speech, then you have to have a secular state. It's impossible with a religious state. So uh, religion should, as, a, as, as an institution, should be separate from the state. Secularism doesn't mean you have a non-religious society. You have a non-religious state. So people who want to believe in certain ideas, religious ideas, you know, however crazy they are, they can go on to believe in that and of different kinds of religions as well, as well as the non-believers, which are much more important of the atheists. So, and in order to maintain uh, that, uh, what we take as a civilized society where you have freedom of thought, freedom of inquiry and freedom of expression, then it's a must that you have to have a secular state. I'm That's going to have important. to stop you guys there, sorry. Um, I just wanted to thank a few more of our wonderful 61 donors who gave initially for our gorgeous cameras, which you can't see. Um, and uh, they are Owen D, Susan Mansfield and Muriel Seltman. Thank you guys. We're getting more donations though, of course, because we have a new fundraising campaign for a video mixer, a computer and so on and so forth. Uh, because it's very difficult for our director and assistant director, Reza Moradi and Pune Ravi, to actually manage to get this. It takes a lot of work and so that's what we're asking for. You will see instructions on how you can donate to the new campaign at the bottom of the screen. We hope you have enjoyed this program. Please do consider this yours. Send us your comments, send us video, um, you know, 30 second videos giving us your opinion on issues and we'll try to air as many of them as we can. We hope you enjoyed this, week pro this week's program and we look forward to seeing you again next week. Goodbye until then.